Moth caterpillars are voracious feeders. They just mow their way through the vegetation. And it's usually moths, not butterfly caterpillars, that completely strip your plants bare. After a long, cold winter, there's nothing more uplifting than to finally see the stir of creatures in your garden. Some of the earliest things to get moving are going to be things like woolly bears. Moth caterpillars, which unlike most of their cousins, actually survive the winter in this form as a caterpillar. So that as soon as the ground starts to thaw, they can become active begin to feed again. Most moths, they've overwintered as eggs, and finally when the air temperatures are high enough, the eggs will hatch and out come caterpillars, which turn out to be really eating machines, feeding on the very first flush of growth and munching their way through the summer. Moth caterpillars come in just about every shape and form. Well, a lot of them have quite woolly caterpillars. They're covered in little hairs or spines all over the body. Many of those hairs are actually tipped with irritating chemicals, so it makes it difficult for other creatures to eat them. Oftentimes, these uh, woolly coats can also act as an insulator, and in many cases, they're very dark colored, so in fact, they can absorb energy from the sun and warm up the caterpillar so they can get active you know, that much sooner in the day. Perhaps even more interesting are some of the ones that are the larvae of sphinx moths, or uh, hornworms they're called, because they have a really distinctive little horn structure that sticks straight up from their backside. The giant silk moths are probably amongst the most spectacular caterpillars, though, because they're big and sort of cigar-shaped and cigar-sized sometimes, with, again, very smooth skins that are often covered in colorful knobs and patterns all over them, so they're really kind of interesting looking. These knobs are used as a warning coloration, you know, to keep creatures from feeding on them. Others of them are used as aggressive displays, you know, they try to imitate something else or try to look like they must be toxic. But sometimes the best defense is just to fade into the background. One of the most common moth larvae are actually inchworms. They're the larvae of some of the very small noctuid moths, the ones you see around your light in the evening all the time. And they're absolutely fascinating creatures just because of the way they move. Though so step by step, they work their way through the foliage. If you sweep through the grass, you'll often find thousands of them, you know, one of the most abundant insects out there. The beauty of having this long, thin body, either green or brown, is that you can sometimes just disappear, too, when a predator's out looking for you. All they do is they stay attached to the stem at one end and then hold their body sort of erect or rigid at right angles to the stem, and it really looks like a branch off a twig.
At times, it can seem like your garden's only there to feed moth larvae. In fact, more than 90% of the caterpillars in your garden are moth caterpillars. But take heart, moths pay a price for their high density. They're very subject to predation. Often they're the number one meal choice for predators. For a predator like the stink bug, it doesn't want the struggle to go on too long because it doesn't want to draw any attention to the situation. It might lose its prize or it might become eaten itself. So instead what it's going to do is try to drag off its prize underneath the leaf and finish the business in privacy. It's not an easy life being a moth caterpillar. Those that do survive, though, are well worth taking a look at. They're some of the strangest creatures you're ever going to find in your garden. Caterpillars have occupied all kinds of feeding niches, you know, different things you can manage to turn into food. One of the more interesting ones, I think, is the leaf miner. What they actually do is burrow into the layer between the upper and lower surface of the leaf. So they're feeding on the lush, soft growth with all the chlorophyll and all those other things in there, and leaving behind the tough outer layer so that protects the caterpillar from predators. Some of them may live out their entire lives there and finally even pupate in that same space before they emerge as an adult that can go out and mate. Often moth caterpillars are highly specialized about what kind of food they'll eat. Whatever plants the eggs have been laid on, the caterpillars will remain committed to. They eat no other food. If you're a home gardener and you're worried about moth destruction of your vegetation, there's a couple of things you can do. One of them is you could just learn to live with it, usually knowing that the plants will survive it and appreciate it for another event in nature that you get to watch. The other thing you can do is selectively control those caterpillars so that in fact you don't get the same level of damage. But probably the best biological controls are the ones that are already out there. 
So often when you see caterpillars, you should realize that all kinds of creatures are feeding on them anyway. So whether you intervene or not, there will be biological control. Caterpillar is going to do this much eating, of course, it's going to do a lot of growing. But again, like all insects, caterpillars have their skeletons on the outside, an exoskeleton, and it's fairly rigid, it's just not that pliable. So when it reaches the outer limits of its ability to stretch, there's only one solution left for the caterpillar if it wants to grow anymore, it's got to shed that skin. The skin splits and they essentially walk out of their skin and now they've got a new soft pliable skin that can expand further to accommodate their growth. His job now is to wait for his skin to toughen up and just survive the first night. One of the strategies that's made moths very successful, of course, is sociality. They often live together in groups, and in groups there's some safety in numbers. One of the things that you can do as a group, for example, is to build a large structure that a single individual would never be able to manage themselves. Tent caterpillars build big silken masses in the tree that actually form a tent over the colony. So, for example, when they're not feeding, often during the daytime when they're, you know, just really want to stay out of the way of the sun and predators, they all stay inside the tent, cluster together on a branch with this huge mass of silk around them. Often very fine silk, but woven in layer after layer after layer. Really a formidable barrier for any predator to have to try and go through. And then at nighttime, when they want to feed, they leave their silken tent and move out into the foliage and eat. At the end of the season, when you find one of these webs, what you'll find is there's masses of dark material in there. This is really the old skins that they've molted out of, as well as a whole lot of little fecal pellets, masses of them often. So really, these tents now have become their garbage dumps. Once a caterpillar's eaten and grown as much as he's going to, he seeks out a quiet place in the garden and begins a magical transformation. All the time they're in the pupal stage, wrapped up in the cocoon, there's a great deal of activity going on. Essentially what they're doing is they're pulling apart their body and reassembling all of the parts to make a brand new structure.
Finally, when the adult form is ready to emerge, it now has to work its way out of the cocoon. Sometimes that can be a fairly tricky process. Usually open at one end, tear away the silk, and then squeeze their way out, and then finally sit there and dry off for a while until they're ready to fly. This final stage as an adult is, to say the least, a brief stage. In the case of most moths, it's only a few days to a few weeks maximum. The sole function of this stage is reproduction. They're just sexual machines. Most moths don't even eat during this short adult stage. But like most rules, there's plenty of exceptions. Smoky moths are pretty long-lived creatures. They have a long straw-like proboscis that sucks up the nectar from a flower. And they're pretty heavy drinkers, often visiting hundreds of flowers a day just for a taste of the sweet stuff. So you might wonder how they're managing to survive in the daytime when most other moths are avoiding the daytime. The way they do that, of course, is that they're quite poisonous. The brightly colored markings on their body and their fluttering method of uh, flying actually are like little signals to the rest of the predatory world that they probably shouldn't be eaten. It's amazing that two so very different creatures, like a hummingbird and a hawk moth, could have such similar adaptations and occupy almost the same niche in the garden. They both tend to hover in place, and they have to have a long beak, or in the case of the moth, a proboscis, which can reach deep into a tubular flower. And they're both out there feeding in the garden in the daytime. It must make for pretty intense competition between the two. While you're sleeping, moths are busily out there picking up the work where butterflies have left off, the work of pollination. They're well adapted to this because their long tongues can reach down the corolla of tubular-shaped flowers to reach the nectar. Of course, when they do this, they can't help but inadvertently pick up the pollen and transfer it to the next flower as they go about their nightly rounds of your garden. One of the primary enemies of moths is bats, because they're also flying at night. Now, the way a bat finds a moth is that it puts out a very high-pitched sound signal, effectively it's sonar, and what happens is the sound waves bounce off the flying moth and then return back to the bat. And the bat can judge how big the moth is, what direction and what speed it's flying at, just by the nature of the returning sound waves. Now, a lot of moths defend themselves from this by having little ears that are sensitive, in fact, to the sonar of a bat. So when they hear a bat, the first thing they do is break into uh, evasive maneuvers. They fly zigzag and maybe drop down into the vegetation to get out of the bat's way.
Mods use a variety of different ways to defend themselves. A lot of them have the upper wings that are often cryptically colored, so they blend in with the background as camouflage to look just like the tree trunk that they're resting on. But if that doesn't work, then they have a backup defense. What they can do is spread their forewings forward and expose their hind wings, and on the hind wings you'll often see bright spots that look a little bit like eyes. So what they're hoping for is a startle effect to fend off predators. The reward for survival is a chance for sex. Like bloodhounds, male moths use their sensitive feather-like antenna to search out the scent of a female, often within a radius of several miles. The males will then mate with that female, and if they get a chance, maybe even a couple more, and then shortly after that, they die. Once mated, the female then goes out and lays her eggs, and that's usually the last act of her season. Eggs are one of the ways that moths survive the winter. Another way is as pupa wrapped up in a cocoon. These paper-thin walls are made of silk. It's strong enough to withstand the worst that the winter can throw at it, and yet light and porous enough to let the creature inside breathe. Silk cocoons are the way that some moths survive the winter. Nestled in their protective coat, these tiny creatures will ride out the winter only to come back next year to greet the nights of spring. <laughs>